Good morning again. Uh, my name is Iftach Ian Amit. Uh, we're going to do the down the rabbit hole talk today. We're going to talk about investigating, for lack of better terms, a criminal server. Some technical aspects about it, some social aspects about it, uh, some economical aspects about what's behind it. Uh, even some legal stuff. Uh, I'll try to keep it fun and entertaining. Uh, I'll try to keep it technical enough so it won't doze off. Um, and it's mostly about you know having fun while doing research. So bear with me, and if it's not fun, just throw something at me. I'll, I'll crack a joke or something like that. Uh, just a bit about me. Iftah Yanamit. In Hebrew, it makes much more sense, so don't even try to pronounce it. Ian is, is fine here in the US and everywhere else outside of Israel. Um, I'm kind of on my own right now, doing some consulting to, to three major companies in the past. I used to be director of security research at Aladdin, which is a, a web security company. Uh, same thing at Finjan, which is a web security company. <laughs> uh, various security consulting gigs, stuff like that, uh, both IT as well as R&D. And, uh, and my spare time, a helping hand with the Israel Air Force uh, during my reserve duty. Uh, so without further ado, let's dig in. First of all, how do you start anyway? How do you even find a criminal server to start looking into and dig up information and do some research to figure out how do these bad guys work? Well, obviously, over skills. You gotta be lead, you gotta be cool, and you gotta have a lot of luck. <laughs> Anyone familiar with a site called Trick Cool Tips? Nothing. Come on. It's, that's the site. It's a forum. It's a forum uh, for, how do they say it? Tips for better pro programming. We just happened to stumble upon it, seriously. Uh, scanning the web, you know, combing the desert uh, from, from space balls, looking for sites with some kind of malicious content, and you know, during some, some research, we stumbled up across this site. Well, I wasn't familiar with it either until we just you know, saw some malicious stuff on it. And, uh, and then we started correlating the badness that was on that site with other instances of interesting badness that we've seen before. Uh, anyone from Italy here? OK. Feder Consumer Sumatori. Thank God there are no Italians, because I'm probably butchering this. Uh, it's the Consumer Reports for Italy. A uh, major site, a lot, of, uh, a lot of hits per day, was hit with the exact same badness that we saw on, uh, on trickle chips or whatever it is. And we started correlating it more and more of those sites, looking for that same badness, so to speak, uh, for the same malicious. It was actually a malicious JavaScript. Um, so we... we kind of figure out, you know what, let's dig in. Let's see where everything points to, where everything starts. And that's where we started seeing interesting stuff. First encounter was a site called gwtsdjeni.com. Very random, doesn't look really meaningful, and we'll see why in a second. Um, now, the thing is, it was part of Torpig. Anyone not familiar with Tor Torpig? Okay, Torpig is, is like a cool Trojan um, that spreads itself, it spreads itself and reports back to uh, domain names generated with some, some form of, of uh, a domain generation schema. Uh, now, it looked real familiar with the Torpig schema, but it had an extra letter. Uh, you know, other researchers, uh, smarter than myself, figured out what's the domain generation schema for Torpig. And it was like four letters, J, E, and I, for that specific month or, or time of, of the year that we found this. But this one had an extra D. So then bells started ringing, you know, light bulbs starting appearing above, above people's heads. And we're like, all right, so this is a modified Torpig or a new gang running this scheme. And that's where things got really, at least got us really interested. Uh, so we took a closer look, all right? Now, this is where the fun part starts. Working for a legitimate company in most Western countries 
don't really let you, you know, turn your ass vigilante and start attacking those servers to figure out what's running there and, and who's behind it. Especially not if you work for a, a public company that's listed on the NASDAQ and, and stuff like that. So the only thing you can do is kind of passively scan, look for stuff that's public, not really like stick your finger too hard, and figure out what's up there. So with a very basic scan of, of uh, uh, predictable names of files and directories that uh, we try to look at uh, on the server, we found a file called en.php. This turned out to provide us with this. Yeah, I know. Anyone recognize this? Yeah, it's a PHP shell. Um, and then we were like, aha, this is where it gets really interesting. Now, we didn't really do any hacking so far, right? We're just, you know, kind of lamers looking around. But you stumble across a PHP shell. And if you're familiar with this, this is part of the R57 uh, shell suite. This is just the, uh, the command interface. So if you look up for R57 shell.php, you get the whole thing with the file transfer, the FTPs, the connectbacks, the emails, the whatever you want, the, the edits. Really, really cool. At that point, we're like, oh shit, all right. This, is, this might be a problem, even at that stage. Why? Well, it's not ours. It is the bad guys, but you know, are we even allowed to go there? And that's where the story gets interesting. <laughs> I did my, my uh, bachelor de bachelor's degree with, with some kind of legal kind of uh, courses, but I've never thought I had to actually use them. First dilemma was, have you gotten too far? I mentioned it before. You know, you look at a server and suddenly, bam, you got a shell. You know, you didn't even do a connect back, you didn't fire up backtrack or, or a metasploit or anything like that, you just got a shell on a criminal server that's attacking people and spreading bad code. Um, so, as for the first dilemma, well, we just followed an injective script on a legitimate site. Uh, so we found out about the domain name, about the server, legitimately, and we kind of ran across a service that was offered by the server. It wasn't protected, no passwords or anything like that. Uh, that led us, you know, using our knowledge to figure out what's the uh, what's the full shell, uh, the r57new.php. Good so far. Second dilemma, how far can we go? That's where lawyers really get messy. And thank God for General Law Council, back at the company, and the New York lawyers that we worked with. And we figured out what can we do and what can't we do. We can't crack things. We can't guess things uh, uh, that aren't public knowledge. Is that a question? Yeah. At, well, if it's a hacked server, what you're probably going to do is, is talk to or contact uh, the legitimate owner of that server. Um, these questions are in the context of researching a criminal server. And even with that, and we'll get to why we're being so careful with, uh, with the research itself, uh, because it's got a lot of implication not only on the company, but on, on the actual research and its results. Uh, so. Basically, we can do whatever is being provided to us, whatever is being allowed to us through that shell with the permissions that it has means you can't do privilege escalation, even if it's just glaring obvious. You can't do that. Uh, you can use whatever tools are provided that are not password protected. Uh, but if you find additional information that is not protected that can be used to access other parts of the site, you can kind of do that. And the kinda is, is has got some legal fluff around it, so I, I'm not sure about it. Yeah. You you kinda could, yeah. <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's as official as I can get. Yeah. I can't, again, I can't, it's, it's kind of similar to the question that was uh, raised before. 
if it applies to just to criminal servers or to any kind of server that you can uh, investigate or look at. Uh, again, this was in the context of researching a criminal operation or, or a bad operation. Uh, so again, talk to your lawyers, my lawyers, I don't care, uh, and figure out the, the right answer. But this is, again, in the context of this specific investigation. Um, so we can brute force, we can not guess, but if they're out there uh, provided to us, we can kind of use them. So thanks to our uh, lawyers and, and legal department and, and all those uh, nice guys that, that kept me up uh, reading tons of uh, material, uh, we actually went down the hole. And what we found there was really interesting because this goes beyond just some malicious JavaScript or another executable Trojan or something like that. We actually uncovered a lot of the behind the scenes, a lot of the back end utilities and communications that the criminal groups, and there are multiple criminal groups using that server, it's kind of a lease a server or lease a, an operation, and we found it just tons of stuff that, that uh, provided us and, and the law enforcement uh, around the world a lot of information to pursue those criminal groups. Starting with Neosploit, uh, there are a couple of talks, at least that I went to, that mentioned Neosploit. I'm going to mention it again because I just, you know, I spent a lot of time with it, and I'm not going to, you know, just let it go. Um, Neosploit is, a, is a, an attack framework used to, uh, to spread malicious uh, JavaScript attack clients and infect them with, uh, with Trojans or whatever you want. Uh, automated tools to uh, inject legitimate sites with malicious code, all right? Because you want to get, you want to spread the word. You want to get to legitimate sites that are going to attack their customers, their visitors, instead of just providing all that bad badness from the criminal server. Uh, we found a PHP by admin, which is, again, very useful uh, for figuring out the back end. Truck full of Trojans, tons of them. Unbelievable. We even found uh, that this server was, uh, was also used by the Sunoa group, uh, which is the, why well, I mentioned before, the, the modified Torpig uh, domain generation schema. Uh, tons of Trojans, and actually some, some of the Trojan generation uh, uh, tools back there. AW stats logs, always fun to look at someone else's logs and, and figure out you know, how, how active is that server, how many people have visited it, uh, and get some, some statistical information from that. Setup instructions. I kid you not. Setup instructions. You get a manual that tells you how to install several parts or different parts of, uh, of the software that is designed to attack visitors and manage those attacks. Uh, you just get the manual. Uh, a mail backend for tracking infections. Uh, a directory filled with OpenVPN certificates because criminals are secure as well, and you need to connect to that server securely. All right, so you want to open a, an open VPN tunnel to it uh, instead of just connecting plain text. A huge list of cPanel credentials, I'll talk about this later. This was kind of a whiteboard for the several people that were logged, were logging into the server. So one would write down, oh, look at that cool credential, and the other one would say, oh, yeah, I got it before. It's, it belongs to some uh, hosting provider and so on. So really interesting. Um, some more utilities and exploits, and, and a funny 15 most wanted uh, uh, kind of ripoff page hosted on that site. Again, I'll, I'll show it later. Start with a tool. I mentioned that at the beginning. Uh, one of the to interesting tools that we found was called FTP iFramer. Basically, it's a PHP script which you feed with a lot of FTP credentials that were stolen using the Trojans that were sitting on people's computers that got infected by and so on and so forth. Um, and you just feed it with username, password, domain, username, password, domain. And all it does it, is it automatically goes and tries to access that FTP server, tries to log in, verifies that the credentials are correct. Once they are, it looks at what is accessible on that server. If it's web content, great. Look for JavaScript, HTML, PHP, whatever files, and inject an iframe onto them that points to the malicious JavaScript. If it's not, look for other interesting stuff, all right, and set it aside. Um, supports several users, so each user has his own login and credentials that he uploads, uh, so you can actually run multiple campaigns at the same time that are separate from each other to cater for several criminal groups, which means that this server, again, was leased to 
at least three different distinct cr criminal groups that we could, could point out at. Uh, and the logs themselves were accessible. We found more than 200,000 credentials on that server. That's more than 200,000 FTP servers that may or may not, not contain web information, web content, or even non-web content, documents, files, applications, whatever it is, with credentials that vary from read-only to full access. The second tool that uh, we found there, and, and I promised I'm going to linger on to that a, a little bit, is Neosploit. Well, Neosploit is my favorite. It's my favorite because it really shows how in the criminal community or criminal ecosystem, uh, there is a supply and demand. There are the software developers and there are the clients. And Neosploit has got a long documented history of development from, from a very simple exploit framework uh, through its uh, iterations and, and additions of, of multiple user support to support several criminal groups, enhanced reporting, multiple loader configurations, so you can say, you know what, if you're coming from this area, geographically speaking of the world, I'm going to provide you with that Trojan. But if you're coming from that area, there's another Trojan that specializes in you know, banking activities uh, in that area of the world. A uh, database is improved from flat files to a full-on uh, um, sequential database. And in version 3, enhanced licensing, again, licensing in a criminal tool. Uh, I can't remember who talked about it yesterday, uh, but they mentioned it as well. There is a full-on licensing scheme on this, on this thing, and it's locked to an IP, and IP address and the user password. Uh, enhanced installation through a SOX proxy that can only be resolved statically. Uh, enhanced reporting on exploit RI and database management. So this is kind of the, the 10,000 feet view. Uh, digging deeper into the tool, we were actually able to uh, gain access, obviously, all, to all, all the components. Um, first of all, the installation script. Uh, I went through that before, the SOX. Uh, cool install script, by the way. Great uh, bash programming. Takes care of all the, you know, it's, it's kind of stupid proof. Uh, you just run it, it downloads the, uh, the actual CGI, the, the compiled L files uh, from a SOX proc through a SOX proxy. <coughs> Sorry. Does all the version checking, all the uh, permission uh, checking, it creates the, the RC files, and logs everything. We'll talk about the logging in a second. This is a quick view of the uh, install script. Again, using and password are required to even start the installation. Uh, you may, the, the guy, these guys are making sure that uh, your root, because wow, because <laughs> you need to get there. Uh, this is a download URL, which again can't be accessed just like this. You have to go through a SOX proxy. This domain doesn't resolve to anything. Um, some error checking, the SOX, uh, the SOX retrieval. As I said, some some cleanups on the on the Unix system, on the Linux system, in its scripts, everything is ready. And once this is installed, that's it. It will update itself regularly, uh, and you're just good to go. This is what we got from the logs. Again, why is Neosploit my favorite? Because it's well maintained. You can see that there's a demand out there, and that the developers are responding to it. Um, we basically, what we did is, is we logged all the uh, major and minor updates. Basically, every time there was a new version or a patch or an update to Neosploit, uh, in a specific day, we logged the number of times that an update was applied. And this is number of times per day. Okay, So you can see that it's, it was pretty active uh, during the time where we investigated it. Uh, there are some rumors that Neosploit was gone when they came back with version 3.1, and after that they kept maintaining it uh, for a short while until they died again. Uh, but that's, that's a pretty interesting graph that indicates on the level of support and the level of updates that you're getting from a tool that you actually bought from uh, uh, these guys. I'm not saying even bad guys, they're just developers, yeah. That's 2008, yeah. yeah. The rest is not that much fun. I mean, it, it is if, if you're like in the zone and, and uh, doing uh, reverse engineering and stuff like that. It's basically composed of three different parts. The daemon, which takes care of the uh, uh, database backend interface. Index CGI is the exploitation front end. This is what the customers or the users see, uh, where all the logic in terms of 
what kind of operating system you run, what kind of browser you run, where you're coming from geographically, uh, and all those decisions that, that decide what kind of exploit am I going to send you and what kind of Trojan is going to be sent, and the admin CGI, uh, which is the admin interface, where users can manage all the infections that, uh, and, and report on all the infections that uh, they ran through. Uh, some more digging into the, the actual tool. Uh, this is just the fun stuff, again, uh, from uh, the, the Neosploit key val validation uh, going on. The, they're loading the license, ver verifying the license against a server that's uh, available, th that the, the, the developers are running on the internet, and verifying that uh, the installation is running from a legitimate, from an IP that was actually licensed uh, uh, to run from. And this, this is some more logic in terms of uh, referring the, this is the, from the customer or the victim uh, endpoint, uh, getting the hash of the IP and, and the browser string, uh, validating the referrer because they came from a legitimate site and I need to know or document which site actually sent them over here, uh, picking an exploit and encrypting it and sending it back to, uh, to the victim. This is a little more fun because you can get more data out of it. Uh, this is the admin interface. Again, there was a question here about using credentials that are written plain text, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, that's the kind of. Um, this, is, this was done using the, the admin user. So you can see all of the users that are configured on the system and using it to spread badness. Uh, and all of their statistics and specific like detailed vulnerability, uh, performance, reports, uh, that was back at the time where uh, PDF was like really out there and uh, you know, no one patches Adobe stuff and stuff like that. Um, so you can see the statistics, uh, the success statistics of different exploits. Uh, through this interface, if I'm a user of the system, I can actually say, oh, wait, but that SB ActiveX is no longer like really killing people. How about you update it? Uh, hence the frequent updates that came on later and detailed statistics in terms of uh, per exploit, operating system, version, language, and so on and so forth. Off from news poll. Any questions so far, by the way? No, we're good. All right, another script that we found that was, again, really useful and interesting. I mentioned before the domain generation schema, all right? Um, a lot of people were working on kind of reverse engineering the logic of how those malicious domains keep changing well, that was, uh, uh, that was nice, but what we did is we looked at the source code for the domain generation. I mean, it was just there on, on the server. Uh, what actually happened was that the, the Sinol group took the Torpig domain generation uh, script and modified it and adapted it to their needs. Uh, so it, it was great for just keeping track of that server because it was, it was just it just kept moving in terms of its uh, domain and actual physical location. Uh, these are also available, uh, should be available, I think, on the DEF CON site. If not, I'll up upload them later on. Another script that's uh, pretty interesting for, uh, for understanding how do the bad guys work, proxy judge. Um, that's just a little you know, nugget kind of a script. Uh, it's a CGI where, to test whether the, the victim is behind the proxy or not. Sometimes, not, a lot, not always, we, you know, this logic was only applied to part of the uh, attacks. <clears throat> um, this was applied so that the attack wouldn't get twice to a location that was known to run a proxy, okay, for some reason or not. Other goodies, I mentioned you know, this is like the killer one, the how-to in Word. It's just a Word file sitting on the server with instructions on how to install a specific package. So you install, run install PHP, make sure the directory is writable, accessible from the web, blah, blah, blah. Packer verifies the integrity, change setting, check results, uh, additional description, logging, interpreting uh, logs, uh, and more fun stuff. Downside, it's all in Russian. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, always keep, keep a Russian-speaking uh, person in your research group, otherwise you're like really screwed. Last script I think I'm gonna talk about is, uh, or, or finding uh, from the server is the cPanel goodies. Uh, I mentioned it before again. This is kind of the whiteboard for the criminals to, uh, uh, to use for 
exchanging ideas, information, stuff like that. Hundreds of domains. Uh, and cPanel, you know what cPanel is. I'm not going to explain it to you. Uh, just, you know, access, access, access. Inline comments in Russian on some of the sections. Uh, this is like a really, really rough translation. So, but but it's, it's still funny. Like, clearly has not been able to look after. Uh, that was on, on a um, credential that they kept like infecting, and the guy kept changing it, but for some reason they kept getting that password back. So probably the guy that was changing the password was infected, and it just kept fending back to, to the criminals. Um, previously worked as something in Russian, clearly no longer works for entries that are dead and shouldn't be uh, worked on anymore. And need to pop in and remove the soap base. There's probably like a, a, a legitimate word in Russian that, that Google translates to soap base that relates to, I don't know, maybe an installation or iframe, <laughs> I don't know what. Uh, too many sites and it's not small. And my favorite is master admin cPanel. Uh, that was found right next to a credential that uh, related to a hosting site address, like the whole hosting provider. A lot of fun. Again, obviously everyone that was on that list was notified, and uh, I don't know if they took care of it or not, but at least we tried. Um, some humor. Remember the the top 50, top wanted, 15 most wanted thing? Well, this was kind of a... We couldn't figure out if it was a joke or a teaser to law enforcement or whatever, but it was just there. Uh, and this is how it looked like. They took the uh, U.S. Marshals' uh, 15 most wanted fugit fugitives website. They ripped it off and modified it to contain their nicks and aliases and and stuff like that. It's all in Russian. Um, I don't know. It's it's kind of funny, but you know. Now, while we're doing this, obviously we're not just sitting on this data. Um, once we got like clearance from from legal and stuff like that, we started working with uh, Search CC. The reason why we worked with Search CC and not like specific search in specific locations uh, is that this thing was just so spread out that it was impossible for a team. I had like five people at the time uh, working for me uh, and myself to just you know keep emailing and phoning and 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 contacting all those different locations we had like 86 countries that were affected by this uh, so search cc came to the rescue a lot of i don't know if there are any search cc guys here you're not feds it's okay it's you just work with them um did a lot of you know great work in terms of coordination and uh, and were very responsive to us uh, they actually created a small task force to handle all uh, all of that data that was passed along to them uh, and they passed it along to law enforcement as well. Uh, they analyzed the logs, and I mentioned before, 86 di different countries, uh, did all the no notification process, and helped us, uh, again, work with the FBI and Secret, and Secret Service in the U.S., uh, because there are a lot, there are a few, like, high-profile government sites that were affected here as well. Um, so that kind of, you know, raised their awareness, like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you guys. Now, just to kind of visualize what kind of impact this single server had uh, geographically, we took all the, remember the 200,000 credentials I talked about before? We mapped them to the approximate geographical location of the associated servers they were, uh, they were given access to. So this is what we got. And that's the reason why, again, we worked with CERTC and not specific individual countries. Uh, this basically covers most of Western Europe, East Coast, West Coast, and, and some spots in the uh, Far East Asia, Japan, and stuff like that. Uh, and even these guys, I mean, and you can't just say, you know what, I'm just going to focus on the U.S. and a few countries here. Once you lay your hands on something like that in terms of, of a researcher, you've got to notify everyone. I mean, everyone's on the same class. So, I mean, South Africa, Brazil, Peru, whatever is there, uh, you can't just, you know, try to phone them all. So did we get any closure on this? Uh, we did a lot of work in terms of analyzing the tools, analyzing the Trojans, analyzing the, the techniques that uh, were used to dis distribute all this, all this badness. We worked with the uh, CERT, 
to, to coordinate the, the notification to all the affected sites so they can clean them up and stop you know, uh, exposing, their, their, exposing their users uh, to that kind of badness. And it took a few good days to get the notification process. Uh, and after a few good days, most of the sites were fixing their code, removing the iframes, removing the injections, whatever it is. And uh, we actually tracked this through the admin interface for Neosploit, because that's just <laughs> what we had in place. Um, I'll clarify this. This graph tracks down the top five users that were set up on the Neosploit uh, attack framework. Uh, we just mapped out the number of uh, uh, exploits per day that were served uh, and yielded an installation of the Trojan uh, throughout a period of, I don't know, what, three weeks or something like that. This is the aggregated one with annotations. This is the time where we notified CertCC uh, and broke the news and kind of started calling people, shaking down, you know, whatever it is, fix your site, this is vulnerable, this is a problem, you're infecting your users and, and all that stuff. And you actually see a decline. And we're kind of, great, we're doing some good job here. And we're working with, with CERT, and people are fixing their websites, and you know, we're, we're finding the crime, and yeah, we're kind of vigilante, but we did it the, the right way. And then this happened. What we didn't do is that we did not break the business model. These guys get credentials all the time. These guys just keep you know, promoting and marketing and getting new sources of infections every day. And they figured out that if their stats are down, they just need to hit refresh on some of their sources. And that's what they did. So you see a quick peak in terms of site infection that yields installations. And then a dip after a lot of the sites fix it. And you just get back to the levels of you have a solid install base, so to speak, of sites that dis distribute your malware. And afterwards, even a, a, a greater rise after someone got pissed or something like that and, uh, and started working harder. So we didn't really get full closure on this. We did get a, a lot of information on how stuff works. Uh, we did make a lot of ties between the different providers of the software that we found on the server. And we got a lot of insight on how criminals actually work in terms of leasing or providing access to, or sorry, running a single server that caters for several criminal groups with the, uh, with the segmentation between them and stuff like that. But we weren't really happy with this. Now, I did promise a Mikolo connection. Anyone familiar heard of Mikolo? Yeah, all right. Mikolo was shut down happily. Um, it's an ISP here in, in, the, in the US. Uh, a lot of bad stuff happened there. And this was before Mikolo was, was shut down. And you probably recognize this. Joker, by the way, is the user that managed this server. And this is us looking at the, the PHP shell running uh, W and seeing that someone else is logged in to the server at the same time that we're looking at that PHP shell. And this is as close as I'll get to like a criminal <laughs> in real time. Uh, right after that was a, a phone call that I've made uh, to tell someone to, dude, work something out. It's out there. This is, you know, uh, after all the not notification went out and uh, law enforcement was actually in play in terms of tracking down the server and stuff like that. So, uh, but the interesting stuff about this is that the IP address from which the user is logged in actually belongs to Mikolo. So that was just another layer or another uh, uh, evidence uh, in the heap of evidence that, that uh, gathered up that helped uh, close down Mikolo. So Joker was helping Mikolo get, get shut down. <clears throat> now, if we are getting close and personal as we did before, um, we did find something interesting. Some of the, some of the applications weren't just publicly accessible to everyone, OK? Uh, some of the uh, more sensitive applications that manage infections and stuff like that, like, stuff like that uh, were not just open to the public, uh, and they were protected with an HD access on the web server. Now, HD access 
was configured with specific IP addresses that helped, again, this is information that was passed on to law enforcement, helped them point a finger in terms of, oh, so it's that group that's uh, working out of uh, Denmark and that group working out of D.C. and Newark and Russia and whatever it is, um, which is pretty helpful if you keep that on your server and limit access to, uh, to specific users, you're basically outing them if that server get comp gets co compromised. Now, everything that I mentioned so far and covered so far talks about cyber crime, all right? This is the intent of getting, you know, John Doe and Jane Doe infected on their home PC, uh, running some kind of Trojan that's going to keylog them and, and sell all, send all their credentials and, and, uh, and perform financial fraud and banking fraud and stuff like that. But what's the link between these kind of activities and cyber warfare? Well, yesterday I was at the talk, uh, the cyber warfare talk by, by Jason, and I promised him some, uh, some interesting findings from, uh, from my talk, so here goes. Now, what I'm going to show you is, is the only thing that, that was kind of uh, allowed to be shown publicly. Uh, this was found on the server itself. Remember when I said that the, the FTP processing tool was going through credentials, validating them, looking for web content, looking for other content? Well, this is other content. Other content is PDFs, Word documents, Excel files, executables, whatever. One of the sites that were infected or, or breached, uh, whose, sorry, PD, uh, FTP credentials were breached, was actually a site uh, that belonged to some company that manufactures interesting stuff. And this is what we found on the server in a directory associated with the content that was downloaded from that FTP site. Now, if you don't see that really clearly, this is like a map. There are a few items here. There are descriptions over there on the selected items that, that you're looking at. Uh, and if you don't see it really clear, I've, I've kind of magnified a few. Uh, this marker, which is placed here, is an F16D with a position in 12-digit uh, long, long lat. This is it. Uh, if you're familiar with this little triangle, then shut up. And, uh, and some, some log data, report data, uh, 864, anyone knows? What's 86? Apache, um, F16s. They're, they're doing something here, all right? Now, this is just a screenshot, okay, that was sitting along with the application that's running this thing with documentation, with data, with stuff that I was appalled <laughs> when I saw there. Um, but that's there. And guess who's going to be the customer of that kind of data? All right? It's not Raytheon or any, anyone like that. It's a bigger organization or a government that would like access to this kind of information. So some final words. Um, why we should, what should be we we should be looking at in terms of advancement in Trojan technology. We all know the, the classic Trojans that communicate over HTTP, uh, send their data, perform a man in the browser attack, lurk around, look for, for interesting stuff, and, and send it over. Well, mostly communication, because most of those uh, activities can be monitored and signatured, so to speak, to be identified later on and alerted upon. What if we apply the, um, you know, kind of the communication mechanisms of Web 2.0 to Trojans? Well, this is an idea that has been running around in the industry for, for a while. Everyone's been trying to get their uh, heads around this in terms of how to cope with this problem. Fortunately, I haven't seen anyone use this uh, yet. Um, but again, the classic communication was Trojan, Command and Control Center, and HTTP back and forth. And the most sophisticated method of evasion was moving that, oops, moving that command control center around so it will be hard to catch. Now, what if I send the commands from my command control center through legitimate channels, blogs, right? I can't blog, uh, block access to legitimate blogs like Blogger and, and uh, WordPad and stuff like that. And I can even split the command to different parts so 
they would be reconstructed using web applications. Google Gear, uh, Yahoo Pipes, Google Mashups, Microsoft uh, Spaces, whatever it is, they all provide you a very easy API, a very easy programming environment to process this kind of data, RSS web data, and modify it, adapt it, and basically send back or provide a, a, a converted or a, a programming, you know, combined view of, of the three different parts of, of the command to one actual command. Now, again, this is a legitimate site hosted at Yahoo, Google, Microsoft, whatever, and the Trojan communicates with that, not with the command control center. Same goes for reporting back to the command control center. Just post it onto a blog. You can even encrypt it. Uh, by the way, you have, if, you have, if you want any homework, try to look for blogs that make absolutely no sense. Not like language-wise, but just gibberish. All right? Guess what? This is a covert channel used by whoever uh, to communicate between two parties over the legitimate parts of the internet uh, and just post it there. It's, you know, it's got the most uptime ever. So it's just easy. Final, final words. Uh, one thing we did think about in terms of uh, tracking and, uh, and taking this a step further, but we didn't really have the time or uh, the patience to do, uh, mostly legal, is what if we can plant a bug? All right, this server will keep moving around. It started, when we started looking at it, it was hosted in Argentina, and then it moved on to Florida. Uh, it stayed there for a while, moved over to DC. It's really easy and really cheap to move uh, this kind of server around. Now, what if we had the equivalent of LoJack for eCrime? We could plan something on the server, like a web bug or whatever it is, and just Google it or, or look for it and figure out where, where is it hosted next if we lose track of, of the server. Um, we actually thought about it, but as I mentioned before, had a little problem with legal because uh, access has to be granted and um, we didn't get like right access to to the server, and the second problem was working, you know, as security researchers that work for the lighter side uh, of things, is keeping chain of evidence. If you tamper with the data, if you make any changes or modifications, you basically break the chain of evidence, and it can be used by law enforcement to prosecute and can't be used as evidence to uh, to look at these groups. So that was kind of the the, the last part of. Uh, us thinking about tracking these guys. That's it for me for today. We're right on time, I think. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to be at room 103, uh, Q&A room right outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>